How are you, everyone? This is Jae Eun Jung from Seoul National University Dental Hospital. I work at the periodontologist, and today I will talk about the soft tissue graft around tooth and implant. That is easy for clinician and comfortable How for patient. You, Although I am a periodontist, soft tissue graft always seems difficult in terms of difficulty of the procedure itself, predictability, patient discomfort, cost, and lack of a standard protocol. Okay, so today I would like to talk about a soft tissue graft that is easy for operator and comfortable for the patient. So I will briefly review the anatomical characteristics and dimensions of the periodontal tissue and tissue surrounding the implant, which are the basis for soft tissue graft in implant and natural tooth. And then soft tissue graft for function on the posterior area and soft tissue graft for aesthetics for anterior area. The anatomy is kind of boring subject for most of the clinicians, but understanding the anatomy of the periodontium and peri-implant mucosa is very important to manage the soft tissue. First, we'll take a closer look of the anatomical differences between implant and tooth. And then, we will talk about the appropriate soft tissue dimensions around the tooth. The soft tissue anatomy of the tooth and implant. As everyone knows, the biggest difference between the tooth and implant is the running direction of the collagen fibers that make up the attachment. There are collagen fibers that are vertically embedded in the cementum in natural tooth. And there are also dentogingival and dentoalveolar fibers. However, since there is no cementum on the implant surface, so the collagen fiber run parallel to the implant apex and embedded into the alveolar crest of the periodontium. From this attachment of the implant and the surrounding soft tissue is mainly maintained by fibroblast parallel to the implant and therefore, the attachment is weaker than that of the tooth. Looking at the blood supply around the implant, blood flow is supplied only from the supraperiosteal blood vessels, unlike tooth. The tooth are also supplied with blood flow from the PDL side, and this forms a vascular plexus at the part where it becomes an attachment here. However, in the soft tissue around the implant, unlike natural tooth, it is difficult to observe the blood vessel in the mucosa attachment part of the implant. So it is obvious that implant has less blood supply than natural tooth. Because of these differences, periodontitis and periimplantitis have similar symptoms and clinical features, but the progression of the disease is slightly different. In periodontium, there is a non-infiltrated connective tissue zone between the pocket epithelium here and alveolar crest. And the biofilm attached to the tooth is separated from the connective tissue by the pocket epithelium. But unlike periodontitis, in peri-implant site, there is no pocket epithelium. The epithelium is ulcerated and the local factor attached to the implant surface is directly exposed to the connective tissue. So bone crest is, shows the much more severe bone resorption here. So in peri-implantitis site, uh, as you see in these pathological differences, the destruction of the periodontium in implant site is much faster and severe. In other words, although natural tooth and implants have common features, they show differences in connective tissue composition and alignment of con collagen fibers and distribution of vascular structures. And it did also affect the prognosis of outcome of soft tissue augmentation around tooth and implant. So you can think that soft tissue graft around the implants will be harder than natural tooth. 
Okay, next part is dimension, in other words, biologic width. Whether implant or natural tooth, there is some soft tissue attachment above the alveolar bone, which is called biologic width. Biologic width plays a role in protecting inside of the periodontium from the external environment and microorganisms, so it is a protective barrier. Therefore, if an appropriate biological width is not secured and restoration invades it, the gingiva inflammation or alveolar bone resorption may occur. The amount of biologic width around tooth is about 2 mm, that is 1 mm of a connective tissue attachment and 1 mm of junctional epithelium. Uh, this is a view of soft tissue attachment at the implant with the abutment removed. The connective tissue attachment or adhesion site is here in the red area, and the pink area is circular epithelium part. I think the tight sealing of this area will play a very important role in protecting the tissue around the implant from outside. The amount of biologic width around the implant is similar with that of natural tooth. Many studies suggest that the biologic width exists around the implant and that this is a physiologically formed and stable dimension as is found around tooth. The sum of circular death, junctional epithelium, and connective tissue attachment is about 3 to 4 mm. It is a uh, slightly larger than a tooth, but you can think of it as uh, having a similar biologic width. Since biologic width exists even in implants, problems can be occurred if the adequate soft tissue thickness is not secured. Uh, this is a very famous research by Bogrund and Linde. They observed by thinning the gingiva of the implant to less than a 2 mm, and it was observed that Crestal bone loss was caused and soft tissue attachment was obtained to secure an appropriate biologic width. In other words, if implant depth is shallow or soft tissue is too thin, gingival recession may occur in the long term to secure the soft tissue of 3 to 4 mm. Therefore, looking at the implant placed here, some of them seems very shallow. In this shallow place, at least 3 mm of gum was not secured to maintain normal defense mechanism. In these places, as mentioned above, gingival recession or crestable loss may occur. Therefore, if gingival is too thin, the implant can be placed 1 or 2 mm deep below the alveolar crest to secure the appropriate gingival penetration height. Conversely, when the gum is very thick, over 4 or 5 mm, like in this area, uh, if this depth is too deep, the prosthetic process becomes very hard and complicated, and there is a possibility of peri-implantitis occur. Uh, in fact, bone loss occurs when proper dimension of the gingiva is not secured. Looking at this case here, this is uh, one of my case. Uh, first of all, the crown margin located too deep, it is too close to the alveolar crest, and the contour is too wide. And the gingiva is very thin here. It can be expected that crestal bone loss due to this combination of factors. This is the opposite case. The gingiva is too thick. Number 27 implant here had severe vertical bone loss before extraction, and implants were placed with only sinus elevation without vertical GVR. In this case, the thickness of gingiva becomes very thick, about 6 or 7 mm. Although the crown margin has been raised a bit here, but there is always a risk of peri-implantitis. It often swells like this. It seems necessary to reduce the softest dimension a little through, through palatal thinning like this. So we can make, maintain the peri-implant health. Summarizing everything so far, the soft tissue around the implant is similar to the tooth, but the travel direction of the connective tissue fiber, 
parallel to the implant and the blood supply is less than that of the natural tooth, which is particularly disadvantageous at the implant site and soft tissue attachment. And its thickness requires a certain amount of space just like natural tooth. These differences between natural tooth and implant cause the soft tissue prognosis of soft tissue augmentation. We can guess that soft tissue around the implant is much harder than the natural tooth. Uh, okay, let's move on to the soft tissue graft procedure of posterior area. I usually do the free gingival graft FGG at the posterior implant site to obtain firm and stable gingival. The ideal soft tissue around the implant is, first of all, it must have some thickness. And it is good if it is keratinized, and it is good if it is firmly attached to the underlying tissue. Since most implants are placed after some alveolar bone loss has occurred, keratinized tissue is often absent. There are controversial lizards that can keratinize gingiva is necessary for implants to maintain the perimplant health. Even if there is no keratinized gingiva around the implant in here, some cases show that perimplant health can last for a long time. But in some case, if there is no keratinized gingiva, the alveolar bonus or soft tissue inflammation can occur. Although the results of the study are still controversial, considering the characteristic of soft tissue around the implant that we looked at earlier, that is, they are more vulnerable to the progression of inflammation than tooth, it would be good to secure keratinized tissue with an appropriate surgical technique. Keratinized gingiva around the implant, it has several clinical advantages. First of all, it is easy to maintain around the implant, and it provides a solid fibrous attachment to the implant and a close color around the implant. It is more resistant to gingival recession or gingival inflammation. It is much easier and less uncomfortable for patients during prosthetic procedure. To obtain the adequate keratinized gingiva, Maxilla already has sufficient amount of keratinized gingiva on the palatal side, so you can just give crestal incision to the palatal side, or you can use palatal releasing incision to get the enough keratinized gingiva. On the other hand, in mandible, uh, you can get the keratinized tissue by free gingiva graft like this. In maxilla, I usually make horizontal incision palatally, like here, to use palatal keratinized gingiva. But sometimes, uh, in the incision that is located too palatally, and GBR using barrier membrane was done, poor blood supply at palatal side cause sloughing like this and secondary healing. If the flap is insufficient to even with the crestal incision on the palatal side, palatal releasing incision can be used, like here. However, if palatal releasing incision is made too deeply and too long, there will be some bleeding and the blood supply to the palatal flap will be decreased, and that is not good for he healing. In mandible, adequate keratinized gingiva is secured through free gingiva graft. FGG can be done before implant surgery and during the implant placement or second surgery and after the prosthetic step is all finished. After FGG, the width of keratinized gingiva is maintained very stably for a long time. The effect of free gingiva graft is not only to increase keratinized gingiva, but also it can deepen the vestibular depth, and this is very important. FGG was performed while placing the implant in the edentulous area where the vestibule was very shallow. Along with securing keratinized gingiva, the vestibular depth deepens and this makes tooth brushing very easy. Usually, 
FGG is performed in patients with poor oral hygiene or with the periodontitis and in the site where extensive GBR was done or in the site where the peri-implantitis occurred. In such a thin leach like this case, mucogingival junction is at this level now, but if you do buccal GBR and pull the flap more and suture it, you can expect that there will be no more keratinized gingiva on the buccal side and vestibule will be shallower. When the implant was placed in the thin leach, this large distance defect is occurred. So I did GBR on the buccal side with a lot of graft. The surgical site healed well and please check the location of the mucogingival junction here. During the second surgery, a very lingual incision was made here. Inside, the newly formed bone is absorbed with an adequate thickness. However, despite the lingual incision to secure a very small keratinized gingiva, almost only mucosa remains on the buccal side after healing of treatment is connected. So, free gingiva graft was needed. I did free gingiva graft and you can see the white keratinized gingiva band on the buccal side and deepened vestibule. Even with long-term follow-up, the results are well maintained. The gingiva around the implant is very firm and stable. Also, I usually use FGG in the sites with peri-implantitis. This is an implant I placed, but about a year after loading, the crestal bone loss progressed a lot. First of all, if you look at the crown, the crown margin is deep uh, below the gingiva. When I removed the crown, the gingiva was compressed a lot and there was some bleeding. And the buccal keratinized gingiva is very small and vestibular depths were insufficient. So after the mechanical debridement, I decided to do the regeneration therapy, remake the abutment and crown, and also do the FGG to make better circumstances around the implant. Uh, let's look at the each step of treatment. Peri-implantitis is treated first. Uh, flap was elevated, local factor like calculus, plug, and cement remnants were cleaned with ultrasonic scaler or any other rotary instrument. Tetracycline soaked cotton pellets were placed at the exposed implant surface for about 2 minutes, and bone graft with collagen membrane were used for regeneration. After healing, free gingiva graft was also done due to the lack of keratinized gingiva. Uh, the graft was a, a little bit small at this distal side, so there was a bit short of the second molar. The abutment and the crown were also remade. First, the crown margin is raised above the gingival level. In this way, cement, remo cement removal is easy, and since the crown abutment interface is not located subgingivally, it is advantageous to maintain periodontal health. Looking at the x-ray, there is a defect filling here to compare the previous x-ray. And also there is a firm and stable gingiva around the implant. This is about five years after the treatment. FGG site and regeneration site is well maintained during the five years. In the same context, if the implant fails due to the bone loss around the implant, FGG is often performed at the same time when the implantation. Please take a look at the number 26 implant here. The bone loss around the implant is, se is severe and there is no keratinized gingiva on the buccal side and vestibular space is too is insufficient. This is after the crown remover. Look at the position of the mucor gingiva junction here. We cannot place the new implant in this site. We have to do something. I placed the new implant with GBR and epically positioned the flap, but the de depth of vestibule is still insufficient. 
and there is a high frenum attachment here. So I did free gingiva graft on the buccal side. And this is the healing after the free gingiva graft. The crown is delivered. Uh, look at this healthy soft tissue around the implant when healing of a tumult is removed. Compare the width of keratinized gingiva here and here. Uh, if the first implant had no problems in, the, in this state, it was maintained where it could be, it could have been used in this state. But when we retreat because we have a particular problems, we should do FGG so that we can secure a more prognostic result. The best part of FGG is that it can get sufficient keratinized gingiva and the procedure has very high predictability. One of my co-workers always says that FGG will be successful if you don't put the graft inside out. And that is true. Only thing that we have to concern are location of mental foramen and graft stabilization. Sometimes we secure keratinized gingiva by FGG, but if a recipient bed is not formed well when grafting, the graft cannot be attached or fixed onto the underlying periosteum, so food can easily get inside a tight seal cannot be achieved. Here the FGG was done, but there is no tight sealing, so there are much food infection under the FGG site. Therefore, when making a partial thickness flap for grafting, it is necessary to remove these loose tissues or attachment well so they do not remain on the periosteum. Next, we will look at the case of soft tissue graft in the anterior region for aesthetics. We can do the soft tissue graft for both tooth and implant, but today I will tell you about the soft tissue graft around the tooth mainly. Soft tissue management is required when the gingiva go down apical like this, especially in the anterior region. Gingiva recession is natural tooth is usually classified according to the Miller's classification, and the prognosis of each step is evaluated. First criteria is how much the gingiva recession extends, and second criteria is if there is interdental bone loss or not. And third criteria is if, there, if the tooth is malpositioned or not. But there are some limitations in Miller's classification. According to the Miller's classification, the prognosis of root coverage using FGG is listed here. 100% uh, for class 1 and 2, and partial coverage for class 3, and no coverage for class 4. But this refers to the prognosis after FGG, not CTG, which is usually used a lot for root coverage. And this is not actually a prognostic value obtained by research. It is just a hypothesis. And there are some other limitations in Miller's classification. First, even if recession usually goes beyond the mucogingival junction, there is always a thin free gingiva that is keratinized in this marginal gingiva area here. So in fact, it is not easy to distinguish class 1 and 2. In addition, there is no standard for exact amount of interdental bone loss when classifying class 3 and 4. And if there is no marginal recession and only the interdental papilla is down, an appropriate category cannot be found. The biggest basis for deciding whether or not to do root coverage is how much coverage I can get achieved after surgery. The distance from ideal papilla to the cemento enamel junction is replaced epically starting from the top of the present papilla, that is the level you can obtain by the root coverage procedure. It's three months after root coverage, but the gingival margin has been restored to a coronal slightly more than the expected coverage level. For root coverage, subepithelial connective tissue graft is the best method and golden standard regardless of flap design or number of the surgical sites. Surgical sites. 
Subepithelial connective tissue graft can achieve favorable root coverage at both single dissection and multiple area like in these cases. The best result can be seen when connective tissue graft is performed regardless of various flap design, such as Langer and Langer method or uh, pouch method or tunneling or circular incision only. Anything is okay. We all know that FGG is very effective to get the enough keratinized tissue and subepithelial connective tissue graft is the best way to cover the root recession. But both technique needs two surgical sites and patients who open complaints about discomfort, pain, and bleeding at the palatal donor site. So we need more, e we need more easy and comfortable ways. When we do the soft tissue graft, especially for root coverage, we often use subepithelial connective tissue graft called SCTG. This is a golden standard. But we can use a cellular dermal matrix ADM, and we can also use DGG, the deepithelialized gingival graft. I want to talk about the DGG precisely here. The major two methods for connective tissue graft is SCTG and DGG. SCTG is more traditional graft, but I want to tell you about DGG, which shows similar clinical results to SCTG, and it is easier to harvest. Let's take a look at two procedures. First, uh, this is SCTG. Make the incision design of the primary access flat. If you are get used to harvesting connective tissue, you don't have to make one or both vertical incisions. And this will promote uh, vascular supply of the cover of the donor site. The blade proceeds epically parallel to the external palatal surface and split thickness flap elevation and the graft is being harvested. After removing fat and glandular tissue from the graft, the look at the soft tissue protecting the bone is left, covering and suturing the external flap. This is about seven days after the surgery. The donor site shows excellent healing. Next is the epicellized gingival graft, the DGG. Incision design is made. Or you can make incision design like this or like this. Anything is okay. It is just up to you. The blade proceeds epically parallel to the external palatal surface in order to maintain a uniform thickness of the graft. Soft tissue covering the periosteum has been preserved. This is after harvesting of free gingiva. There is very minor bleeding on the donor site. And this is how we do the deepicellization. And this is harvested graft and suturing after the collagen matrix was applied. And this is seven days after surgery. It shows excellent healing. It is very similar to the SCTG case. This is a section of palatal gingival. DGG is cut from the upper part of the palatal gingival that include epithelium and lamina propria and little from submucosa. And we remove the epithelial part of the graft. SCTG is cut from the lower part here, so it contains lamina propria and much of the submucosa layer. So DGG has harder tissue than SCTG, so it is easy to handle. And also, SCTG is collected with a lot of this fat layer here, so this can lead to the post-operative contraction later, so it would be nice if DGG was used as graft. Also, harvesting graft is much easier in DGG than SCTG. If you don't have to leave the epithelium cover, it's much easier and time-saving. Uh, this is a video of removing epithelium from the graft using, I usually use number 15C blade. To harvest DGG, we have to get free gingiva graft first, and then we have to remove the epithelial part. I usually remove the epithelial part in two stages. 
First stage, I used the diamond round burr before graft harvesting. And then, after graft harvesting, I used number 15C blade also. After removing the epithelium of the outside of the graft, uh, I have to remove the granular tissue or fat tissue in the inside. Okay. In DGG, we remove the epithelial part, but there is a little concern that if the epithelium is still remained. Uh, this is a histology of DGG and epithelial remnant is here and here. But according to the various studies, epithelial remnant like this does not affect the clinical outcomes. But we still have concern about patient morbidity like pain, discomfort, or bleeding. Uh, many of us think that SCTG shows faster healing and less discomfort because of there is an epithelial cover of donor site, but in most cases, the cover is too thin, so there can be sloughing of epithelial cover during healing. It means that secondary healing occurs in SCTG site too. And moreover, according to Jukeli, uh, he compared the SCTG and DGG according to the pa patient morbidity. The painkiller consumption and discomfort, uh, bite, bleeding, and inability to chew, and stress, there was no statistical differences between SCTG and DGG. Uh, to reduce the patient discomfort is very important thing, and I usually use the mucoadhesive periodontal dressing at palatal donor site. A new mucoadhesive periodontal dressing called ORAID was developed. ORAID is a dressing system comprising a mucoadhesive layer and backing layer and provided attached to a thin film. The protection layer here the outer surface of the dressing and to protect the wound area from the outside. And the attachment side here is the inner surface that attached to the gingiva. This part is attached to the wound. And this dressing can last for one day, but it can last for about a week if we can use suture together. Mucoadhesive dressing should be trimmed according to the length of the surgical site and the excess of saliva and blood should be removed by gauze and adapt to the surgical site with 30 seconds of finger pressure. Aura aid can be applied to the both recipient and donor site in the free gingiva or free connective tissue graft. The mucoadhesive dressing is stabilized the blood clot at palatal area and will dissolve in a day. But I usually, I was usually, I used to usually cut pack for palatal donor site before, but patient has very, patient had severe discomfort by the burkiness in the palatal area. The use of oride right greatly reduced the patient complaint of discomfort. Uh, left side, just after the surgery, I did FGG and applied surgical cell and aura aid and suture for the donor site. And this is just 10 days after surgery. Donor site shows excellent healing. The dressing will last longer if you use suture. I use cross matrix anchor suture for dressing here. Uh, the needle starts here at the buccal side of tooth and passes through the palatal gingiva and go back to the buccal side of the tooth and make a note. With this suture, you can stabilize the dressing very firm and easily, and there are less needle insertion points than conventional cross matrix suture. Uh, this is a video of suturing the dressing. Okay. Uh, I harvested the deepicellized gingiva graft from the right palate and I put some surgical cell for bleeding control and apply aura aid before. And I did cross matrix anchor suture. Uh, first, the needle go from the buccal side of the tooth and then 
The needle goes through the palatal gingiva here. And go back to the buccal side of tooth. And then make a note here. Then the suture will compress the dressing very firmly. Uh, after FGG or connective tissue graft, I usually use the three or four suture of the donut site to stabilize the wound dressing. Let's see again. The needle go from the buccal side of the tooth and go through the palatal gingiva. Sometimes the needle cannot go through the palatal gingiva easily if the palatal vault is too deep. Yes, and then the needle go back to the buccal side of gingiva. And make a note. You can see clearly this area that the suture can compress the dressing very firmly. Uh, I will show you some soft tissue graft cases. I usually have copper of root coverage patients every week. Therefore, this procedure should be performed very easily for me and very quickly for me. And also, I should minimize the patient discomfort or pain after surgery. Here is a gingival recession on number three on tooth here. This is very common case. Gingival recession extends to more than mucogingival junction and there is slight papillar loss too. Prepare the recipient site. I usually use longer and longer technique, but I don't try to make split thickness flap at lower anterior tooth because, as you know, the lower anterior area, the flap is too thin and if you try to make a split thickness flap, the flap will be teared or perforated. Full thickness flap is okay too. It will show the same clinical result. And I harvested graft. Uh, this is just after the harvesting and I did the deepicellization and fat tissue removal was done. Uh, look at this graft. This one shows a great evenly thickness. Uh, the, gra the DGG is very good for handling like suture of the graft. Place the graft on the recipient site and using mucoperiosterilizing incision, the flap was advanced coronally and secured with sutures. The position of the graft and flap is kind of overcorrected. This is about 8 days after surgery. The wound shows good healing state that there was a slight sloughing of the graft here, but you can check the revascularization of the graft here. And this is just after the surgery, the left side. I applied the surge cell and ura aid to cover the wound and the suture. The suture have the dressing last for few days. And this is seven days after the surgery. The dressing remains at the wound site too. After removing the dressing, the wound site showed good healing state. This is about two weeks after the surgery. Compare the pre-surgical state, SCTG was successfully done. This is another case, very similar. I did root coverage using DGG as usual, and coronally advanced flap is done. And eight days after the surgery, three weeks after the surgery. Here is donor site. I applied surge cell and aura aid, the mucoadhesive periodontal dressing, and sutured. Eight days after dressing, and uh, the dressing was still remained. And this is three weeks later. You can check the almost complete healing of the palatal site. This is a soft tissue graft of implant. 
Number 11 implant was placed about 7 or 8 years ago and at buccal side, there is a soft tissue concavity and sinus tract opening here. And the marginal bone loss is found in this periapical x-ray here. So I removed the crown and abutment. And ele after elevation of the flap uh, and conventional root planing ar around the implant was done. And this picture shows the tetracycline application of the exposed implant here. And I, after that, I did some bone graft using bovine bone. And I applied collagen membrane was N. I did additional connective tissue graft using DGG at number 11 implant site to restore the buccal volume and eliminate the sinus tract and suture the wound. This is surgical splint to stabilize the palatal wound also for hemostasis. On the surgical splint, I also applied Oride too. Most of the patients doesn't have discomfort using this splint. They can eat some food with this appliance too. Surgical splint is made using the vacuum former and I use the 0.5 mm thickness sheet. It is very easy to make. This is a surgical splint and just after you harvested the graft from the palate, apply this splint for bleeding control and then you can go to the recipient site and uh, put the graft and do the suture. Seven days after the surgery and after stitch out, the wound shows good healing state and the mucoperiosteal dressing is still here. So we performed a clinical trial to figure out the effect of mucoadhesive periodontal dressing. We recruited about 35 subjects and each subject underwent periodontal flap surgery at two quadrants. One quadrant assigned to group one and COPEC was applied. And the other quadrant was assigned to group two and we applied ORA8. Uh, as a result, there was significant difference according to the postoperative pain. Oride group showed a significantly lower score of visual analog scale of the pain after one day after the surgery. As you will confirm in this research, we, the advantages of recordative dressing are less pain and discomfort and less required time and no limitation of working time and superior aesthetics. Okay, uh, these are take-home messages. Uh, before we perform the soft tissue graft around the natural tooth and implant, it is important to understand the histological differences between the two tissues. Free gingival graft can be done for function and it is relatively easy procedure to high predict high predictability, so it would be good choice to maintain periodontal hairs around the implant. For aesthetics, connective tissue graft in anterior region for root coverage is the most common case. For easy graft harvesting and handling, DGG it will be the good choice to reduce the patient's discomfort applying mucoperiodontal, mucoperiodontal dressing and surgical splint is very helpful. If a soft tissue graft is performed with a proper procedure for a proper indication and proper treatment is applied to the surgical site, especially the donor site, patient discomfort can be reduced highly, predictable treatment results can be obtained. Do not be afraid of soft tissue graft, but actively try them. Okay, uh, this is what I got and thank you for your time and thank you for your listening.